Welcome back to another chess game analysis video. So today I want to show you a game that I played in a club tournament last week and I'm playing with the white pieces and there was an interesting opening that I want to show you that I've already covered a little bit on the channel, one of my most favorite and most aggressive openings. It's Jevon's Gambit and in this game a little bit of a strange variation, maybe even an improved variation of the Evans Gambit came on to play. Beginning e4, e5, I wanted to go for the Italian game because I knew my opponent usually responds with knight c6 and here we can go into an Italian game. And he plays h6 here, which is a little bit slow. Normally this would be the main move development and then you can immediately kick with b4 and get, go into Evans Gambit. But even if h6 and after castles, now bishop c5, and you already see the engine thinks that after d4, white is already plus one. So h6 is a little bit slow in the position. But I just feel like with castles and this h6 move, this gives me an, a better variation of the Evans Gambit because I've already castled. So I went ahead with b4 here, which is interesting. It's not the best move, but it can definitely. Um, complicate things a lot and since I like complicated middle game positions where you can attack this is my style he took the pawn c3 kicking the bishop bishop a5 queen b3 going after the f7 pawn and now you the best move in the position would be to defend with the queen uh, queen f7 uh, f6 but he played queen e7 which is a little bit inaccurate because now this gives a tempo bishop a3 and the bishop wants to go on to a3 anyway because this diagonal is very nice so you can restrict black from castling kingside and this is one of the points of the Evans Gambit so that the king is stuck in the center and we're going to see that in the game as well. So after bishop a3 now the queen is forced to go to f7, f6 where it could have gone a move earlier so I basically won another tempo and as you know from the Evans Gambit tempo is very important. Um, don't be slow in the opening when you grab the pawn you need to develop very fast or you need to give back the pawn but here queen f7 so white already has a very nice development uh, with d4 striking the center and he took here which is a little bit in inaccurate um, as i already said i think in this position you need to give back the pawn knight g7 d takes e5 queen g6 and development um White is still better, but you have sort of a little bit ruined white's pawn structure here. So black is okay. After e takes d4, the problem is e5. Now gaining more space and kicking the queen again. You see the pawn is already dangerously far advanced here on e5. And at some point there is going to be a breakthrough that we're also going to see in the game. Queen f5. So now we took the pawn. Knight takes d4, attacking the queen again, and queen moved to g6. And now this is probably, I think, the best piece from black, which is constantly threatening to take here, maybe um, when the bishop covers the e1 square so that the rook doesn't give checks. And it's also, at some point, maybe there are some fork ideas. If the bishop ever moves, you have this fork on the queen and the and the bishop, so now I decided, okay, this is black's best piece. I'm going to trade it off. And after b takes e6, the pawn structure of black is also a little bit messed up. Rook e1, normal development move. You see, I've given back a pawn, but I just develop normally and I try to maybe now at some point open the center with, e5, uh, with e6, which is going to be disastrous if the black king is still in the center. Bishop b6, I like the move, it's a little bit prophylactic move. I wanted to go here anyway and attack the bishop and look on to this diagonal and he makes a prophylactic move back. Now I played my queen a4. Now with the idea of e6, breaking through, sacrificing either the bishop or the rook on e5, then taking here. There are a lot of ideas, but it's very nice that the queen is now aligned with the king here and the rook is also aligned. So we have quite a nice attacking position and a little bit, I think, paralyzed position from black. He played a6, which is not that great. e6 now breaking the center. If you take with this pawn, then this is completely lost. So my opponent took with the f pawn, which is better. And now I made a mistake. I sacrificed the rook. 
I thought, okay, now the pawn has to take and I have this very nice fork. But actually, better in this position would have been to sacrifice the bishop instead. I was, in the game, I was very worried about king d8. I was like, okay, what happens if he just hides here? Because now the bishop is attacked. Somehow the queen hasn't really got access. This bishop is a little bit useless. What do I do here? And I completely missed the idea that if he does this, there is actually an interesting combination. You can take the knight here with your bishop. And the rook can't really capture because that's already a mate in seven, according to the engine. Because you have, and this is what I missed in the game, this very long queen move that gives a check and I completely missed this. Um, long queen moves with check are normally quite hard to spot, but uh, I completely missed it because after queen h4, you have problems. You have this rook cutting off, you have this, the bishop looks in here, so the only reasonable move is queen g5 now blocking with the queen, but now you have this very nice bishop e7 check. King has to move and now you just win the queen and it's going to be a mate in three. So actually this king d8 maneuver after the bishop sacrifice, um, the declined bishop sacrifice, so not taking the bishop but rather moving the king, this is what really worried me about this position and that's why I tried to sacrifice the rook instead. Um, by the way, in this position, um, you can't, after the king moves, you take the knight and you have to play something like d6, otherwise it's a mate in seven as I've shown, but then the queen check comes anyway. You queen trade and then you save the bishop and you're just up a piece and completely winning. So this is why king d8 would not even have worked. So the other variation would have been if you sacrifice the bishop here, you can accept the bishop, which is... Right, d takes e6, then we have the queen check here, king f8, and uh, king f7, and now you take the rook, and you up an exchange, and according to the engine, also winning. Um, there are also options, I think this was one of the most interesting moments of the game. You can also just decline it with playing knight e6, but then you also have queen h4, threatening checkmate, checkmate here. Uh, if the knight moves, the rook is also here, aligned with the king, so there are discoveries, maybe winning the queen. This is a very hard position uh, to play. The engine says plus two, but I think for a human being, even though black is up a pawn, this is completely, this is crushing. I don't think you could defend this. So bishop takes would have been the better approach to the position. I just played rook take because I was really afraid of this king d8 maneuver. But now he takes my rook. Queen takes with check and for forking a rook, but remember I already sacrificed the rook, so I'm just getting back my material. And the best move here would be king f7, and after we, afterwards I would take the rook. And even though this is a complicated position, the engine says it's plus, it's more or less equal. And I think I would even be happy in the game to play this position. The bishop pair is very active here. And the development's still not there. How is this rook ever going to get into the game? So I thought even this would be all right for me, even though the engine doesn't like it that much. Minus one, according to engine. But I thought this was even, also with this king here, very hard to play for black. So after my queen check, he did not go into this variation, but he played king e8, um, which is not that great, because now the rook has better checks. If the king... It's on f7, the rook can't really check, but here the rook can very nicely also come into the game. I first of all took the rook because I'm down material, so I need to equalize. Queen g4, late in the game, this is not a good approach. I think queen c2 would have been better with the idea of threatening checkmate here, so I have to defend against checkmate, and after knight f6 development. You maybe kick away the queen, with such a, such moves and then develop the knight, bring the rook into the game. This is still better for white, but queen g4 allows me even a better development with knight d2. Now immediately bring the rook into the game. So he played knight e7, development move, which is all right. Now I captured the pawn here and I thought, okay, at some point I'm going to take the knight, then I take here and this is completely winning. Um which it could have been punished better would have been, I think this very nicely shows that even though I make a, make a couple of inaccuracies, the position, the, the, the 
attacking position is just so dominant that I can even sacrifice stuff and make a little mistake here and there and still the position is so much better for white because it's just the activity of the pieces and I think this is very interesting because it always shows that you, the activity is just so important. And the engine even likes h3 better here. Kicking the queen, queen f5, knight f3 with the threat of bringing the rook into the game. And after like rook f8 you can even attack this pawn which is now overwhelmed. And afterwards, when you've taken with the bishop then this bishop is also pinned and it's everything is pinned. The king's still in the center, bishop pair very nice in this open position. Um, yes, I think this is completely winning for white. So I would have been a little bit better off with this, but instead I grabbed the pawn. I thought, okay, why not overload this bishop right now? Uh, he played e5, which is... I wanted to show you why this is not a great move. He has this very nice queen a4 move. Now attacking both of my bishops and this is why after bishop b7 I have to queen trade and go into this endgame which I'm only up a pawn instead of a mating attack which is definitely better for white in this position but of course I wanted to go for checkmate. You're not playing the event gambit to reach an, an endgame where you up a pawn but you want to checkmate of course so after this happened he played e5 he did not see this maneuver with the queen here, which I saw in the game, I was a little bit afraid and that I had to go into this endgame being up a pawn. But fortunately, knight e, uh, he played e5, which now tries to cover the bishop with the queen, which is also a nice idea, but now knight c4. And this is completely crushing. The knight is going to take here. At some point, I'm going to block with, after the bishop is gone with f3, the rook is going to come into the game and the black king is just going to get checkmated. Engine already says plus 10, so it's completely winning. Black, uh, Black can't really do a lot, so he tried this desperado sacrifice. Bishop takes f2, and after like 5 minutes of thinking, I realized that there is nothing really wrong. You can even play king h1, or you can also take the bishop. I took bishop because I thought, okay, material advantage. Why not take the bishop? Rook f8, check king g1, and he has like two moves of counterplay. I play, uh, he played king e8 here. Trying to get out of some rook checks, but now the bishop can check. King d8, knight takes e5, queen f5, and now you can try to find the winning combination for yourself. It's always nice when you're attacking, you always try to have as many pieces into the attack as possible. So rook d1 check came, and you have a lot of problems. The bishop here very active, the bishop here is pinned, the knight at some point can move, but then the, at least the exchange is going to fall. So my opponent in this position realized that it's a mate in three and he resigned the game here. The only thing you can really do here is putting pieces in between to block the check, for instance, 95. It doesn't make a lot of sense. He could have played it out for the checkmate, but I'm going to show it to you anyway, so you can enjoy a nice checkmate. Rook takes d5, queen d7, putting the queen in between. Rook takes queen, king e8. And now you have a lot of ways of checkmating. You can take here with the queen. You can also go for a little bit more of an aesthetically pleasing checkmate. For instance, rook takes pawn with check. And after king d8, you have bishop e7 with this double nice double bishop checkmate. Or you can also move the rook all the way back, giving check from the bishop. Not this bishop, this bishop. I already miss a little bit. There are too many pieces in the attack. I don't really... Um, a little bit hard to keep up which piece is now giving the check and after c5, uh, c6 blocking the check you have this very nice checkmate where four pieces are, are actually participating in the checkmate so i would have liked to have this on the board as well but i'm also happy that after d1 check my opponent resigned the game and i think it was a very nice attacking game and i liked to play this a little bit um uh, not a variation of the Evans game, but I, I still think I would call this, this an Evans game, but just with h6 in the middle, which is a little bit weird, but I think maybe this is playable. The engine says, or the, rather the, the book says that it's called an Italian game anti fry liver defense. I think it's rather an Evans game, but with this, just a transposition of move order, because the only difference is basically that black wasted the tempo with h6. 
You can write into the comments whether or not you think this is actually an improved variation or a worse variation of the Evans Gambit. Also send me games that you would like me to analyze if you've played a game. Check out my YouTube, um, my other YouTube videos, my Twitch, my Instagram, and my Leeches community study where you can analyze all the games that I'm covering here for yourself if you want to analyze them even more. I hope you liked this video and I'm going to see you back in another one. Bye.